hello folks uh, welcome back hope you enjoyed baby's talk and before the next talk i have a little announcement to make uh, the devs uh, the dev sprint and workshop tickets are open uh, you can buy them until the end of the conference today uh, till 8:30 pm so make sure to buy the ticket because they are in limited quantity now for the next talk uh, we have rohit goswami with us he is a doctoral researcher at university of ireland he works on large data problems in quantum chemistry and machine learning and he has over 10 years of experience in uh, open source development and today he'll be telling us about reproducible and scalable workflows in nix paper mill and rector uh, so rohit over to Thanks so much for the introduction, Nikhil, and I'm very happy to be here. So, uh, as mentioned, I'm at the University of Iceland. I'm in the Faculty of Physical Sciences, and I'm very happy to be here for PyCon India. So, it's a long title, but we're going to take it slowly. We're going to take it piece by piece, and we're going to get to the end of this in a meaningful manner. So, what are we going to be talking about? We're going to talk about why this is important. Then, we're going to discuss how we share our Python code with each other. then we're going to talk about the revolution which is the nix ecosystem finally we're going to uh, talk about some practical aspects including reproducibility and high performance clusters in general high performance computing clusters that likes of which you might see at your university and we'll discuss how they're different from say spinning up a cloud computer somewhere all right so what is the story here perhaps if you've been programming for a while and maybe if you've taken a graduate level course on software maintenance then no matter what language you're working in you'll probably end up with something like this you'll write some code then you'll refactor it into objects or more functions depending on your language you will test them possibly at multiple levels maybe even fuzzy tests all kinds of tests if you've been programming for a while you'll definitely document your code if not for yourself i mean if not for your users then for yourself and then you'll have some sort of setup instructions that's pretty standard On the right, there's an example of this workflow in Python. So you might load NumPy and you might write tests with PyTest and docs with Spinx. You can just as well imagine this to be a C++ workflow where maybe you'd load Eigen, maybe you'd test with Catch, and maybe you'd write docs with Doxygen. But there's an issue with this approach, and that is, for one thing, this is not how we do data science. <clears throat> and one of these libraries, Pandas in particular, is different from the rest. How so? Well, if you've done modern data analysis, if you've taken a course called machine learning, or if you've even gone over the tutorials over at TensorFlow, then you'll realize very quickly that modern data analysis is more of a try before you buy approach, right? I mean, on the right, you have an example. The text is too small, but that's not the point. You see some sort of plots, you know, some sort of descriptive statistics. You're maybe loading a file from some online source. You're inspecting your data. You're inspecting your objects. something which in traditional programming is normally left for debugging right and one of the reasons behind this this approach of course means that we need a strong level of interactivity and python of course right from the read print eval loop of the regular python uh, repl to ipython and then the jupyter lab interface both notebook and then later lab and finally through proprietary spins on jupyter python supports interactivity Now we're not going to be talking about Colab except uh, very briefly towards the end in terms of practical aspects, but we are going to talk a bit more about Jupiter. So what is Jupiter really? Well, Jupiter is a gas giant. Okay, that's that's not fair. Jupiter is a community. Jupiter is an ecosystem of tools. What does that mean for us? Well, Jupiter can subclass a bunch of kernels: Julia, Python, R, C++ through Zing. Although, of course. Julia has moved to Pluto but that's for a different talk. Now the main interface which we'll be discussing is the Jupyter notebook. And what is a Jupyter notebook really? We'll see a concrete example of this a little while later, but for now, take my word for it, a Jupyter notebook is an executable file which is meant to be consumed by a server. Now, that's an important distinction. because it means that you as a data scientist are going to be interacting with your browser which is going to be communicating with a server somewhere the server will spawn kernels for you to run things on and the interface is essentially the ipynb file now you might be wondering why did we have this i mean why this kind of setup and the answer is interactivity you can do a lot of things with regular literate programming for anyone who's used org mode or something else 
But what you can't do is manipulate HTML widgets and other things. And that's probably why we care so much about interactivity in Jupyter Notebooks. Okay. But there's a problem here. How does this fit into the first paradigm which I showed? Where, where does this Jupyter ecosystem really fit in? What is it meant to replace? Are we supposed to replace our libraries with Jupyter Notebooks? Are we supposed to replace functions with Jupyter Notebooks or variables? I mean, we could just consume an IPYNB file for variables, but that seems like overkill. And this is really what I want to talk about. And of course, Colab makes things worse because Colab, unfortunately, does not support a lot of standard Jupyter tools that we'll discuss in this talk. So now, moving on, how do you generally share code with someone? Well, we know that a .py file is a module, and it's standalone if it only imports in the standard library, which means on a good day, if the stars align and you send someone your .py file and you imported nothing special apart from the standard library and they have the same version, everything works. Reproducible code. Great. And we can take this a little bit further. We can have a pure Python package. We can have a dunder init.py. And we can use pip, you know, even better. We can actually go slightly further again. We can have two types of distributions, the sdis, which basically just package a bunch of these source files, and binary disks. Like wheels of cheese, binary disks are pretty great because they include static libraries. That means they work across multiple operating systems, as long as you only need some static libraries. OK, now this slide is shamelessly copied of a much more interesting presentation on packaging by Mahmoud Hashmi, but we won't be really going into packaging further. What we will discuss next, though, is are there soft requirements we have not considered yet? And yes, there are. BIP itself. Now, for those of you who have ever compiled Python from scratch, you may have fallen into the rut that pip itself requires some libraries to compile, which are not always present, depending on what sort of system you're working with. So we find out then that pip is not perfect. Pip has system libraries and build tools. But there are some standard ways of dealing with this. And before we get to that, let's talk about the other part, the other elephant in the room. How do we? manage all the different Python packages which depend on each other and have these <clears throat> their version problems. And of course, until now, the most standard method is requirements.txt. At this point, I would like to check if people have filled out the, uh, ah, OK. I see we only have one person filling these out. So that's that's great. OK, I see a 50-50 on Conda and pip plus virtual land. OK. Now, pip is, it is still the Python standard. You know, I keep hearing that pipn will replace it, poetry will replace it, but pip is still currently the only standard approach. And a better way of dealing with this is if you have a log file, if you have a toml file or some kind of structured file where you declare your dependencies, and then the resolution mechanism runs and stores the results in log files, OK? And for system dependencies, though, we have a problem. How do we manage these dynamic dependencies? How do we manage uh, getting libraries when we need them to run our Python code? There are a couple of approaches. There are impure file systems like Anaconda, which basically creates a kind of fake copy of your tree, of a Unix tree, and then works through that. There are the container-based systems, all of which require running the service. Perhaps this is something which maybe you may not have considered before, but that is an overhead. And furthermore, there's a caching problem. Now, we all know when we start a new Python project, we should probably have a nice little virtual environment. Back home with my 8 TB hard disk, I didn't really care how many times I was installing matplotlib and how many times I was installing NumPy. Out here with just my laptop, it becomes more of an annoyance to have to install pandas eight different times in eight different virtual ends just because I want to be pure and within best practices. So how do we fix this? How do we go beyond this? Well, with Nix. So before we get into this, this is a simple dependency tree, right? Package A feeds into package D, which also depends on C and B, right? And this brings us to a very important point. How does a computer know, or what do we do to 
tell a computer where to find our binaries? The answer is the path variable. The answer is always path. For those of you who have written documentation, especially with Sphinx, maybe you've manipulated your Python path to include the subtree which you're trying to document, right? And really, to the computer, especially in the Unix file system style, everything is a path. And Nick says, with its strong academic pedigree from 20, 2004, Nick says, let's, let's not give the users the choice. Let's not let them install to say, slash opt or slash user local bin, or let's, let's get rid of that. Let's instead have a single space where the hashes or what the file or folder is called is predetermined and can be computed in a deterministic manner. And that's the next store, farthest from the right. And then we say, well, you know, if the user wants to use it, we'll just expose the binary itself through a symlink. Now, the one in the middle is a level of indirection required because Nick supports rollbacks, but we're not going to get into that. Now, why, why would we do this? Well, for one thing, this way, <clears throat> the user doesn't get to mess up and install a bunch of different things which depend on other projects which may or may not be there. Here, we have a reproducible hash, which is stored, the hash, name, and version, seen once again here, right? And of course, there are the paradigms of Nix on the left. We won't cover them. Now, I know in, uh, in 17 minutes I have remaining, it is going to be very difficult to ask everyone to code along with me. But still, these slides are out there, so this is included. An interesting thing about Nix is that it spawns a bunch of demons. Okay, it spawns a bunch of build users, which we basically like because we want to run concurrent builds. So how does this fit with Python? Okay, maybe you've installed Nix. So the first trial, let's just directly set up a Python environment. Now, how do we bring this a, le a level further? We can actually use this in scripts, which will ensure the same Python environment. Now, notice that this is a big step forward already. No longer do we need our users to start mucking around with virtual ends or anything. We say, I'm going to give you a script. And when you run that script, you're guaranteed to get the same Python environment I used within reason. And one of the things within reason is an aside into purity. If we were coding together, then those of you who have PyEnv, which messes around with your path. Again, it, it uses shims to set your Python. Then you might have complained that, hey, you know, I ran the Nix shell and I'm still getting my good old pi and Python. The reason behind this has to do with purity. And when you pass the pure flag, then you ensure that only the dependencies you have declared are going to be available in the, in the next environment in the runtime which you're doing. Now, how do we make this a little bit, bit better? For one thing, we would like to expand upon our script setup. We would like to get an environment out of this, somewhat like the virtual env, and we can do this. OK, a word about the syntax. This is the Nix expression language. It is pure, and it is proudly not Turing complete. There are reasons for this, but um, one reason is it's a configuration language. It doesn't need to be Turing complete. Now. This is how you canonically build Python packages with Nix. If someone has not already contributed it upstream to Nix packages, this is what you would do. Note that there are several important things here. Most importantly, that we are able to pin the version which we are building by its hash, which is a lot better than pinning my version, although we are also listing the version. OK. And this is um, there's some nuances here which have to do with uh, building packages in Nix, which we're not going to cover. But what we are going to talk about is how do we make this a little nicer? Because maybe now you're thinking, my requirements.txt has around 200 packages. You're telling me I have to write an expression for all of them? And this is, this is a legitimate question. In some sense, yes. But <laughs> let's, let's talk about how we can make our life easier. And in particular, we're going to be talking about Mark Nix. Now, as an alternative, there's also Poetry 2 Nix, which is simpler if you already have an existing poetry project. But we're not really going to get into that. The other tools here have to deal with the fact that even when you install Nix, when you run an import, then you need to ensure that you're getting the same. So this is an impure import, because this depends on whatever the user has globally defined. 
Let's try to replace Conda completely. Let's try to get, let's try to see this in action. Now, remember that word I said about impure imports? Now here we're defining our sources. Here we're saying, no, I'm not going to depend on whatever the user has installed. I'm going to depend on this project local source, which I have defined. We're also going to pull in Mahnex. As you can see, we, we are pulling this in from GitHub repo. And now we're going to build our Python, but this time we're going to be able to use requirements.txt. Note, this has to be a standard requirements.txt, not one of the fancy ones generated by poetry, which includes IDs and hashes of its own. But this is great, you know, within reason, although Mathnix is a little slow at first because it does dependency management at first and resolution, it's faster later. And all the other caveats apply, all the other standard setup details apply. We can still write our own functions for things which are not done. Now, there's a lot more about Nix, you know, too much to consider in this talk. You can even make Docker images out of it. But now let's move forward. What is reproducibility? Reproducibility is the ability for someone else to monkey around with your code, almost as if they were stealing into your house and sitting at your PC. It means and that, that has a lot of connotations because it means it's more than just telling someone, oh, here's the data, and these are the results, you know, figure it out. It's much more than that. It includes code, it includes tools, and there's this beautiful graphic on the right which pretty much explains it. What does this mean for us though? Well, now, there's some jargon on the right. Those of you who have done a lot of data science are probably aware of this, but it's not really that important. What is important is that a lot of these problems are, at least at first flush, already solved. We know already that using version control tools like Git or Subversion or Mercurial, we can keep track in some sense, a log, have a log of what we're doing. We can collaborate with tools like Overleaf and Google Drive and OneDrive, and we can even reproduce environments through Docker, Nix, or even Conda. The final part is a little bit of a data analysis specialist topic. It deals with the common workflow language and essentially how can you reproduce full pipelines? We'll see a little bit more about that in a bit. But now let's talk about the environment in which you or me are going to be discussing the rest of the stuff. So what is an HPC cluster? What is a high performance computing cluster? Well, there are a couple of ways to figure out if you're on an HPC. First and foremost, you'll be thrown onto a login node. You'll probably not have any kind of GUI access. You will definitely not have Docker. If you're very lucky or if you're in some parts of the UK, you will have Singularity, which is kind of like Docker, but without the security concerns. You normally run a kernel so old that there's no user space support. So you can forget about pROOT and more uh, specialist tricks. It's probably going to be running a super old version of CentOS. Maybe the GCC you have is GCC4. And it has a network file system. That's actually quite important. Now, the network file system can be anything from NFS to something like Luster or GlusterFS. Now, the resource queue is another issue. You'll normally have a resource queue, something like Slurm or PBS Torque. And you may or may not have support for LMOD, which is a little path manipulator written in Lua. OK, so that's the HPC cluster. Now, what's the HPC problem? Well, the problem is if you're on an HPC, you're very likely doing some sort of scientific analysis. And when you're doing such scientific analysis, then everything counts. So even though technically all you really need to do is get from raw data to results, all these steps in between are what's called the provenance of your data, of your analysis. And it's important because those things are required when you write your paper or when you want to explain it to your colleague. OK, so how do we get these concepts to work together? Now, recall that when I discussed the architecture of Jupyter, I mentioned that the server which we're communicating with runs different kernels. Now, it so happens that the server itself lives in an unholy union of Node and Python. I call it an unholy union because it has thus far at least more or less completely defeated the ability of Nix to cleanly package things into pure environments. 
There is with Jupiter from Twig, but it doesn't work very well for all kernels. So it's a better idea then to set up your Jupyter server manually with Conda. Do it once, do it right. Use a node manager, you know, just never use system anything, right? So use NVN. You might need to track bits of the provenance manually, like plugins and setup. And then you can, ex of course, export a nice little YAML file, which you can copy around and use to spin up again with Conda everywhere you go, OK? You should always consider derenv. Whatever you do with your PC, consider derenv. It'll make your life easier. And this is an example of some of the configuration which you might want to do, OK? Now let's talk about the other tools. Now, I've been programming for a long time, and I personally have not found anything better than GDB for debugging. And therefore, Zeus Python, which does not support much of the magics which people know and love, is still the best Jupyter debugger because it gives you an interface almost exactly like GDB. And that's fantastic. OK, now we come back to the crux of this stuff. What do we do with notebooks? Where do they go? What are we supposed to do with them? Well, as in any vibrant community, there are two approaches to this. The first approach is on the right. It's Jupytext, which says, the notebook is really, it's what it should be, at least, is a literate snippet. It should be code plus documentation all in one thing. And that's actually not a new idea. There's a lot of literate programming out there if you know where to look. There's the no web syntax. Org mode is still alive and well. But there's an issue here. Now, for anyone who's ever written a lot of code into a Jupyter cell and has then realized that, oh, OK, so now this works on my data, I must make a function out of it. Then you know it's not a pleasant experience to refactor cells into functions. And it kind of feels like you're just trying to you're just trying to do regular standard programming with documentation in one forced environment. It, it feels like there's a disconnect. That's where paper mill comes in. Now, paper mill says the notebook is a function. The entire notebook, whatever you did in that notebook, can be considered to be one function. You can add some parameters to it, and you can just rerun that entire notebook. Now, of course, one of the pros is this becomes a lot quicker to work with, right? And actually, you can use both of these together because you can actually call paper mill in Python. So you can still have one IPyNV where you're actually tangling with Jupytex. And we'll talk about tangling in a second. And that is going to subclass other notebooks through paper mill. OK, so what does that mean exactly? What is tangling and what's going on? Well. For one thing, we should never commit an IPyNV. I should have mentioned this earlier, but maybe many of you have seen this. Why shouldn't we commit an IPyNV? Well, for one thing, the IPyNV looks like this. It is not human readable. I mean, it is technically if you enjoy reading a lot of JSON. But for most of us, we don't like reading JSON, and we would much prefer having the more literate, cleaned up version on the right, which is what JupyterX does. And that's pretty much it. All there is to Jupyter. Now, what about provenance? How do we actually track provenance? I mentioned the CWL, but it didn't get a slide of its own because we don't really care about writing CWL, which, as far as I can tell, is mostly written by biologists using toil. Now, instead, we will use Renku. Now, Renku is a lot of things. Renku has a web UI. It stores your data sets. It versions them because it uses Git LFS under the hood. It's it's great. you know. It's a whole different platform. But for our purposes, we're just going to use it to wrap our commands to generate CWL files. That's, that's it. That's all you need to do nine times out of 10 to gain a lot of advantages in real life. OK, so now we're coming to the wrapping up bit. So a couple of parting practicalities. As I mentioned, you should keep your Jupyter impure. If only because you don't, once again, you don't want to spin up a different server every time in every project. That kind of ruins the whole point of being able to subclass kernels in the first place, right? So you want to keep one, so per system, you want to have one Jupyter server instance, and you can manage that with Conda and NVM. Don't rely on Colab. It's, it's kind of lazy. 
Because if you rely on Colab, then you're going to have to suffer a lot downstream if you're talking to someone who doesn't use Colab. And you should always comment plain text versions. This is important. You should always use something like Dupitex. And wherever possible, especially when you're doing analysis, you know, exploratory data analysis, try to parameterize the whole function or the whole notebook so that you can actually use this with paper mail. Okay. And yes, petition your sysadmins for Nix. There is a user install setup, which is actually part of a talk at NixCon, which I'll be giving later, but that's it's it's rough. Okay. And of course, use Nix derivations. There's a lot on Nix, especially both in the stock and elsewhere. It will pay off. The learning curve is a little bit steep for those of you who have never used functional programming, but it really pays off. And you can use Renku as much as you'd like. You can use it just to generate CWL, in which case it's a little bit more accessible to other people because you can still host everything on GitHub and you can also just give the CWL files out. But you could also use it maximally and track databases with it as well. Do everything with Renku. Okay. Conclusions, right? You know, congratulations. Well, kind of not quite there yet. There's still two slides. You have to stare at my references. But yes, interactivity is here to stay. This is the way we teach data science. This is going to continue. Gone are the days when you could say, oh, you know, once you're in production, I don't want to hear things about interactive anything, you know. That those days are gone. Jupyter notebooks are here to stay. This is the way people do analysis. This is the way people learn. A lot of people nowadays learn Python only through Jupyter. It's just the way life is. Okay. We can and should adopt some TDD practices. Definitely. There's a reason why unit testing has stood, you know, the test of time. And so with these tools, Zeus Python, Jupyter, Papermill, and Renko, we should be able to meet harmoniously midway. And there's some recommendations or references. And now, finally, thank you. You've reached the end. There's no congratulations here, but yes, thank you. I have some time for questions, but further questions and details along with the slides are on this page. Do I have anyone online? Yeah, uh, let's wait if we see any questions. Nothing as of now. Cool. I guess uh, there are no questions, Fantastic. but yeah, awesome talk. Yeah, that was interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Rohit will be available on the Zulip stream, uh, hash uh, 2020 slash stage slash Hyderabad. Uh, please post your questions there. Uh, he will be available to answer them. See ya. Bye bye.